Okay, so uh, the last speaker of this session and of this workshop is the uh, Professor Chung Yoo Jo, also the, one of the organizers of this school and workshop. I talk about the middle descent of Hoffield model. So please welcome him. I think all of you are already tired, so I will try to present short. Uh, and uh, another good thing is uh, all the important ingredients uh, for this talk, you already learned last week. So I, I'm very comfortable. So you may remind what you learned last week, okay? So I will talk about a gradient uh, descent. So you know, you know about gradient descent, you heard from uh, Professor Meta last week. So you, we have an objective function L, loss function, which has a parameter theta. And using gradient descent, we update the theta, right? You, uh, following this steepest direction. So why, why this works? So actually this is a first order method. If you uh, have a Taylor expansion of this lo loss function up to the first order, right? Then if, if you follow these directions and put theta t plus one minus theta t is nothing but this, right? And plug this into here, then you are sure that your next loss should, be, should decrease, right? Yeah. Or you can interpret this uh, solution uh, as a solution of this uh, optimization. So we, we want to minimize our loss, right? At the same time, we have a constraint. Your next, next step say, theta should be close to your uh, current theta, right? So you want to be your theta uh, stay near the theta t. At the same time, you want to decrease your loss, right? So if you uh, optimize this, then you get this, okay? So you can interpret your, your gradient descent in this way, or you can think this way. So we will come back to this again. But this gradient descent has a serious problem. So th this equation is not covariant. That means you can change your parameters, theta to, to theta, right? Then this doubles and this doubles. However, this gradient term helps, right? In that sense, this equation is not covariant. So to make this gradient descent equation covariant, uh, people uh, proposed another gradient descent. So here you see the uh, Hessian matrix. So it, this can be sometimes Hessian matrix of loss function, or it can be Fisher information matrix. So if you uh, introduce this coverture, then this equation becomes a covariant, right? But there is no free lunch. Calculating this coverture is computationally expensive, and also the matrix inversion is also expensive. So this, this is called natural gradient descent. So natural gradient descent is a kind of second order method because this loss function, uh, I also have the Taylor expansion now up to the second order. So uh, if you mini, uh, optimize this with respect to theta t plus one, then you get this equation, okay? So again, calculating this is computationally very expensive. So smart people uh, developed uh, to overcome this way, this method, they developed the Kojai and Newton methods. So BFGS is one famous one. And recently, uh, people use actually natural gradient in deep neural network. So in that sense, they use this uh, chronicle delta factorization approximate coverture, KFAC method. So if you, you can actually imply this into neural networks if you use this uh, numerical techniques, okay? Today, I will introduce another a uh, very interesting algorithm called middle descent. So as you see here, all these things are convex optimization. This field is developed very, very well. So 
in this society, they are using uh, mirror descent. Let me explain what mirror descent is. So you see, again, this uh, proximal gradient, right? So previously, we used uh, this form. But here, you can see theta and theta t. We consider the Euclidean distance between theta and theta t, right? But it's not necessary to use uh, Euclidean distance. So let's consider some uh, more general distance. This. So as a, uh, as a candidate, we can uh, think about Bregman divergence. Yesterday, uh, yesterday uh, Professor Kopayas introduced us Bregman divergence. So if, if you have uh, some convex function f, f uh, which is a, a function of theta, so f is a convex function of theta, then we can define the distance between parameter theta and theta t uh, this way. So let me explain uh, geometrically what this means. So we have a convex function f theta, right? So we have a point theta and also current point theta t here. So this Bregman divergence represent actually the gap between the function of value of theta, theta and the Taylor expansion or uh, expand from this point theta t, first order Taylor expansion. So the distance between f theta and first order Taylor expansion, that's a uh, Bregman divergence. So it, this is, because this is a convex function, only uh, if theta and theta t coincide, then this Bregman divergence becomes a zero, right? Otherwise, it increases. So instead of this uh, Euclidean distance, we will plug this Bregman divergence into here, okay? Then, this is a loss, a loss function or Taylor expansion, first order Taylor expansion, and this is the proximity with a uh, Bregman divergence. So now, so we want to optimize this with respect to theta, right? Just you differentiate this equation with respect to theta. And here, theta t is just a constant. Then you get this equation, OK? Mm. Then I will use another uh, variable, mu. So you, s you learned this, right? This is a conjugate variable uh, with, respect, with respect to theta, right? f is a convex function. So at every point theta, they have different slope, right? So instead of the position theta, I will use the slope as a variable. That, that's this relation. And actually, we, we have a convex function f, which is a function of theta. But theta is a, a not good variable, which is abstract. But you will see that mu can be a more convenient variable. So I will change my variable theta to mu. How to do this? You know, every, everyone knows how to do this, right? Using this uh, Legendre transformation. And because of the duality between f and mu, you can easily see theta is a, uh, is a derivative of g. Okay? So using this new variable mu, then I can uh, change this equation into this way, right? So this part f, uh, this uh, derivative is mu t plus 1. And this one is mu t. So I rearrange this, then you get this equation. So this is a very interesting equation, actually. Oh. So let, let me check. This looks like a gradient descent, but it's not gradient descent. This is updatable mu, but this gradient is not uh, with respect to mu, but with respect to theta, right? So you should be careful for this point. But let, let me uh, reinterpret this gradient using chain rules. So you can apply chain rules here. Then, mm. so our theta is this one, right? So if you plug this theta into here, then you get this one. So in terms of a mu, actually this gradient is natural gradient, considering the curvature, right? That's the essence of a middle descent. They are updating using gradient descent, but implicitly, implicitly they implies natural gradient. 
That's the uh, key essence of this mirror essence. So let me summarize how you update your parameters in using this mirror descent. It's like this. Usually, when we use gradient descent, we just place in this uh, space, primer space. From theta t, you update to theta t plus 1. But in the idea of a mirror descent, first you uh, transform this theta into mu uh, using uh, this, this loop, transformation rule. Once you, you are in the dual space, you update this using a uh, gradient descent. But keep in mind, this gradient with, with respect to theta, not mu. So, so it, you are doing gradient descent, but implicitly, you are doing actually natural gradient uh, considering curvature. But computationally, this update is cheap, right? You are using, because you are using a gradient descent. So once you update your mu, then we have to go back to our primary space in theta space, right? So this uh, inverse transformation is, uh, you can use this mapping, right? So this is a mirror descent algorithm. Okay. So th this looks very fancy. So I, I want to apply this uh, for updating my uh, neural network. So we, we spent quite a lot of time. Which model is good to apply this algorithm? Because mirror descent has been studied for a lo long time in convex optimization, but not much in machine learning. So we want to find a uh, right model. So finally, as usual, hopefully, hopefully the model comes out. That's, I think, the best model to test uh, this mirror descent. So let me remind you about Hopfield model. So suppose you have a data, which is x, which is multi, in multi dimension, and we have the frequencies of these uh, samples. That's the empirical data distribution, p hat x. So we have this empirical data distribution. Then our goal is we want to uh, model this distribution using our Hopfield model. So Hopfield model is this model. Okay, I think you, you know about Hopfield model. It, it, it's, you can think like this. If uh, you have a sample X, you, you have this uh, network, and each, each uh, very, uh, element has a bias, and uh, between elements, there, there is an interaction. So this is an energy-based model. So given this sample, we can define energy in this parenthesis, like this way. And this normalization factor is partition function, as you know. And so we want to uh, mimic this uh, empirical distribution using this uh, model distribution, right? So to represent this uh, empirical distribution, what is the best parameter B and W? That's the question of learning, right? Yeah. But Hopfield, Hopfield give us a very good solution. So B is nothing but the uh, expectation value of X, Xi, given empirical distribution. And this W or JK is a correlation between Xj and Xk, given empirical distribution. That is called the whole field solution. So you can understand, intuitively understand that this can be a good solution. Because look at this. You, if you get, uh, in this uh, uh, samples, their probability should be high, right? If their configuration is consistent with this average uh, behavior of bias and correlation, then you get a high energy, no, sorry, high values in this parenthesis, then automatically you have a higher probability. In that sense, this should be a good solution, right? Mm. So th this uh, energy model looks a bit uh, complex. So to make it uh, more simple, I introduce uh, another parameter variable, theta. Theta includes not only bias, but also uh, weight interaction. And I also observe the observable, which includes x and also uh, correlation between x. Right? Then you can simplify this model in just like this one. So I use the Einstein summation convention here and partition function. 
And the uh, hope field solution is uh, summarized this way. So again, this is the expectation with respect to empirical distribution. Okay. So actually, this uh, hope field solution is very good to represent the empirical distribution. But actually, you can do better uh, by using the maximum likelihood estimation. So again, you can uh, define the discrepancy between empirical distribution and your, your model distribution. Then if you optimize this with respect to theta, then you can, you can enforce your uh, model be close to empirical distribution, right? In, then you can do better than whole field solution. That, that is called a Boltzmann machine. And you already know uh, what is the best measure of the distance between empirical and uh, model distribution. That is represented by Kullback liberal divergence. You already know that this, right? So the distance between uh, two distributions. And to apply the gradient descent method, you need a uh, gradient of this loss function with respect to theta, right? So because this is this Hopfield model is an exponential family model, so it's very easy to compute this uh, gradient. So the result is this. I'm sorry, it's too dark. Yeah. But as you see in the lecture of before, the gradient is nothing but the expectation difference between um, model distribution and empirical distribution. So you can easily calculate this one. So let me remind you of the, the Hopfield model. This is a partition function of Hopfield model. And this is a free energy in physics. In mathematics, cumulant generating function you, you learned. So again, in this exponential family model, if you differentiate uh, this f with respect to theta, you, you can get cumulant, right? So if you differentiate once, you can have the first cumulant expectation value. And again, Lusandre transformation. And your theta is, uh, can be represented in, in terms of G. So you are ready to apply this uh, mirror descent uh, for Boltzmann, this Boltzmann machine model. So again, the primary space and mirror space, uh, dual or dual space. So. From first, you, first uh, step is uh, going from primary space to dual space, and this is uh, done by this mapping. But in, the, in this exp exponential family model, this is nothing but uh, calculating expectation value. Therefore, this transformation is easy. You can do. So once you are in this dual space mu t, then you can update using uh, this mirror descent because you already know this gradient of loss, right? And then you have a mu t plus one. So, so far, so good. But <laughs> there is no free range. The difficulty is how you uh, come from mu t plus one to theta t plus one. So that's the <laughs> uh, difficult part. But here, uh, we can use, the, again, the Taylor expansion. Actually, we don't need to know the overall range cave of G. We only need to know the range, local range cave of G near mu t, right? That's why we can use the Taylor expansion of G. So this is Taylor expansion up to second order. And we need the, this differentiation with respect to mu. So you, you can differentiate this. And you get this. And what is this? So you know that uh, this, this is theta t plus 1, right? And this one is a theta t. And this one is a coverage. I will uh, show you again later what this, is, what this means. Actually, that is the covariance matrix of your data. And this one is this one. So now you have this mu t plus 1 minus mu t in this calculation. You, you, you know this. And uh, your previous step. So you can get this one. So actually, you can use uh, this mirror descent in Boltzmann machine. So here, here are two important points. One, one is this. 
usually when you use the gradient descent, you start from random theta, right? Random theta. But in this middle descent, look at this. Mu t is nothing but the expectation value, right? Therefore, if you use this mirror descent, you have a very good starting point, mu, mu zero, based on this empirical distribution p hat. I think that's the important advantage using mirror descent in this exponential family model. That, that means you, you don't need to start from random initial parameters. You can start with very good uh, initial parameters based on your data. That, that is our point. And, and another one disappointing part is this. Actually, this gradient descent implies implicitly the natural gradient, right? So you don't need to calculate the coverture explicitly in this, in this process. However, for this inverse map, now I have to calculate this one. So I lose the advantage of this one. But I emphasize this middle descent can, uh, imp can imply this good initial parameterization. So let's calculate this curvature. So dg d mu is uh, theta, right? So you plug into here. That is just the inverse of this one. And if you remind the mu is df d theta, then that is just the one, right? So let's explicitly calculate uh, uh, this uh, partial derivative. Mu is the expectation of uh, this observable j, right? Jth observable. So if you uh, uh, differentiate with, re with respect to theta i, so you, you have uh, these two terms. That means that is a covariance matrix. So let's think about this. This is uh, the middle descent, and this is our inverse map. So if you combine these two, uh, you have uh, this actually natural gradient. So middle descent is actually same with the middle, same with the natural gradient. But our advantage is we know where we should start. In that sense, middle descent is nothing but natural gradient plus good parameter initialization. Okay. So we, we test this. Uh, we actually synthesize the data. So our in, in, we, we choose a uh, bias and weight from sampled from a uh, Gaussian distribution. So we hide uh, this uh, value B and W, which are true, true theta, right? We hide it. So based on this theta, we generated the samples of X. So now I give you this X. Then, then the task is you should infer the true theta. That's our task. So we did this using a middle descent algorithm. So now you will see uh, how your loss decreases with uh, iteration. Com you compare with uh, gradient descent and natural gradient descent and middle descent. You will see how loss changes with the iteration. And also you will see the final inference through theta and infer the theta, how they are, they are coincident compared for these four cases, okay? So the first, uh, the loss change with the iterations. As you see here, uh, this one, red one is a middle descent. In, in other words, natural gradient plus a whole field initialization. That is this red line. And then, why can you apply this idea to gradient descent with a uh, field solution initialization? So that's this blue line, okay? And this uh, gray line means gradient descent with a random theta. So we tried uh, with several random initialization. And the green line is natural gradient, but with a random initialization. That's this green. So as you see here, uh, this middle descent uh, is the most effective way. And also, you can, if you see the inference result, the Hopfield solution is not, not so good, and Boltzmann machine, or well, maximum likely estimation is this. 
And this is a natural gradient with a random initialization, but this one is middle descent, natural gradient with a hope field solution initialization. So this idea works where we checked this. Okay, <laughs> last <laughs> slide. I will summarize. So middle descent is this. In gradient descent, you usually update in primal space from theta t plus t to theta t plus one. But in middle descent algorithm, they use the dual space of this theta. So you should first update from theta two to mu t. But if you use exponential family model, this transformation is not difficult because this is just calculation of expectation value. And here, uh, you, do, you just do gradient descent, but again, it implicitly implies a natural gradient with respect to mu, okay? And then you need to go back to your primal space. So we use uh, this linear uh, inverse mapping. So we applied this to Boltzmann machine, and we, 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 we confirmed that good parameter initialization is very effective. And okay, this is what we found so far, but, but we want to generalize this to uh, more uh, broad models, including hidden variables. For example, restricted Boltzmann machine have hidden variables. So in this case, hopefully the solution, you, based on data, you calculate the initial mu zero, right? But if you have uh, hidden variables, we have no way to uh, fix the variables corresponding to hidden variables. That's the one problem. And another one is actually we, we good, uh, good in parameter initialization based on data, which is a very important uh, subject in machine learning. So we want to uh, uh, go <laughs> for that direction. OK, that's it. Mm. All right, thank you very much. So, questions or comments? All right. So really, it seems to me the thing that you really use here is convexity, and the exponential family only comes in in terms of some way of identifying starting parameters in terms of the derivative, right? Yes. So that, that's really what you want, do you think, for non-exponential family models? Just a better starting point uh, as long as you have a convex optimization problem? Yes. Yes, I, I think so, so far I think our idea only applies to com convex Convex model. No, that's fine. Yeah. It's just I'm wondering about yeah. non-exponential yes. distributions, how, how you would extend this. Somehow you want to connect the non-exponential um, free energy also to a convex function somehow, I guess. Because you need, you need convexity, otherwise that matrix is not necessarily invertible, right? Yes. Uh, any other? Uh, thank you very much. Um, in the last slide, and um, you were comparing different algorithms in terms of the step size, I think, as a function of step size. So h how about the computational time? And so, yeah, ah. uh, Mira descent looks really nice. So what do, what do we have to pay for? Uh, in the real world, so I want to know that kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, you are very sharp. <laughs> yeah, Be because this is a com convex problem. So if you iterate more and more, at the end, a every algorithm goes to the global minima. But the, our algorithm reaches uh, fast. But again, to compute the curvature, it, it requires a lot of co computational uh, cost. So a real computation time is, I think, more or less similar. So in that part, uh, we don't have uh, so much advantage. 
right? Uh, any more questions? Yeah, then let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> Maybe on out. Yeah. Okay, let, let me let me conclude <laughs> our workshop. I, I hope you you enjoyed uh, the lectures last week and work, workshop this week, and uh, I hope it inspires you, <laughs> and you um, you learned many things. And I hope uh, all these things help for your uh, future study. Um, so this this school is possible with the generous uh, financial support from IICTP and also KIAS. Uh, and I would like to thank to our uh, staff, uh, Ms. Liu and Ms. Li. So, and I hope you safely return your home. And my, my last announcement, uh, you, you please have your lunch at the cafeteria. This will be your last time, okay? Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you.